Hello, this is uh, CG5042, ChemEd Design Methods 2. And uh, we're going to cover a lecture today on pumps and specifically on the pump curve and the system curve and how they interact. Now, this is a lecture I usually give in class that uh, we work off the board and just kind of discussion around it. Um, so it's not really con configured for online delivery. So what I've done is just kind of working off the blank slides, kind of sketch out um, what we're going to do and how we approach this. And in essence, what we're doing here, this slide looks a little bit busy. I just drew it beforehand, uh, just before I start for recording, just to kind of expedite things a bit. When we produce a system curve, so what we have here is a plot of pressure drop versus flow rate. Okay, and the purple line here is the system curve. And that's what you should be able to calculate from the piping system. So whatever piping system you design, uh, you, you should be able to calculate the system curve for that using the previous lecture notes, okay? And if you have any problems with that, you need to contact me so I can take you through how to, in more detail, how to do it. So this system curve is the single most important step you do because you produce it and it tells you everything about what your system is going to do. And when you're doing design changes, you're looking at how that impacts the system curve. Again, we may have a system curve that has a high pressure system. So it may go up like this, for example. Or we may have a low pressure system, which would be about like this. And the dashed lines are there. Now, we use this pump curve to determine the operating point. So this pump curve is, again, a pressure flow curve that is produced by the supplier. So this is something the manufacturer gives you. And you plot this curve with your system curve and where the two intersect, it gives you your pump operating point. So we can see here it's marked in black. And this particular pump, this would be a characteristic curve for a centrifugal pump, which would be the, the workhorse of the process industry. So this particular pump uh, intersects with our system curve at this point. Therefore, this is the flow rate down here that we would get out of that pump. And this is the pressure rise uh, we'll be experienced in our system. Okay, if we had a higher pressure system, uh, our operating point will be up here. So this would be a high pressure system. So again, much harder to push the fluid through, which you get much higher pressure drop and much lower flow rate. The low pressure system, this red dashed line, and you see that the operating point will be here. Okay, so you shift depending on the system thing and things you do to your system. You move along the pump curve. So that point of intersection moves along through various locations. Now, how is the pump curve produced? There are standard tests that are performed that the supplier does, and to kind of understand a bit about it, do these a bit so just to declutter the um, slide. There we go. Yeah. So the supplier produces no pressure drop across it. So what that does is essentially puts the pump into a reservoir. So it's not pumping through a pipe or anything. It's purely pumping in a loop from the inlet to the outlet with no flow resistance whatsoever. And that gives you the max flow rate that that pump will deliver. So when you look at the pump uh, specifications and you see the max flow rate, uh, that doesn't mean that you would get that flow rate out of your system. That is the flow rate you would get out of it if there's no pressure drop. You'll also see a max uh, pressure drop value, which is this value up here. Again, how that is produced is the inlet and the outlet are blocked and the pump is switched on. So obviously it just churns whatever fluid is inside there. But that gives you the maximum pressure rise. So there's no flow rate, but coming out of the pump. Uh, so it's just churning away the fluid inside, but it gives you a maximum pressure rise. And you operate in between. So it has this kind of, um, curve shape, typically for a centrifugal one. And I'll come back to the two other pump types uh, later on. There's axial and there's um, positive displacement. And we'll talk about those at the end. But we're going to focus initially on centrifugal pump because that's the most common one that will be used. So 
So that's how our pump interacts with our system. And any changes that we do to our system, so say, for example, we have a valve on our system, we start to close it. But what that valve does is it increases the pressure drop across it. So what you start to do is you start to shift the curve, system curve, in this direction. Because okay, you're closing the valve. So your operating point now moves up to here. So the flow rate is reduced. And if you keep pushing it back, uh, your driver system curve, so it's now almost fully closed. So it's really reduced the flow rate and you're approaching the maximum pressure drop until eventually you lock it and there's no, no um, flow going through and the pump is just churning. So you get your maximum pressure rise. In that case, you're then your pump would be programmed to switch off. Okay, so that's what a, a, a control valve would do. And with a control valve, you want to get very pr precise control uh, over the full range so that it dominates the system. Okay, so that when you adjust it, it really has an influence on the system. So that's what we would do with the control valve and how it affects our system and interacts with our pump system curve. And this is the key thing I want to get across in this lecture is that this pump system curve is your focus for all your design changes. And everything we do, we look at how we can change the pump curve, uh, things like changing the speed of the pump, putting pumps in series or in parallel, uh, and then things we can do with the system. So reducing the system curve, increasing the system curve, things like that, okay, to figure out what the operating point is. Now, why is the operating point important? It's important because there's an efficiency associated with the ability of a pump to move the fluid. So again, if we just draw a quick sketch of a um, curve there, our system curve, put our pump curve in red. So our pump curve looks a bit like this. So typically in, and it's up to the blue kind of color, in this region here, uh, we would have a high efficiency. So I'll say around 90% or so. Okay. Then as we move off this, we move away from that. So this might be 80% efficiency, line of constant efficiency, 70%, etc. So as we move our operating point, I'll just make our operating point here in black. Uh, this here would be the bet, best efficiency point. Okay, so it's the region where the efficiency of the pump is maximum. And really you want to get your pump onto the sweet spot because that is what is where it is designed to operate. And you can operate pumps at other positions. So up here, for example, but they do it less efficiently, much less efficiently. Okay, and what I'll do is I'll upload a couple of slides now just to show you the effect on the pump of changing that efficiency point. Now, I have a couple of slides here that Joe that just illustrate uh, the behavior of a, of a pump. In this case, it's, a, it's an air moving fan. Uh, it's an axial uh, mover. So again, don't worry about that, but the principle is the same. So what we've got are two views, but one is a side view of it. Okay, so this is the flow coming out. This is the blade passage. The motor is inside here that spins it. So the rotation of this is out of the plane, and this is then looking inwards. So looking in from that perspective, is what we see over this side. So the fan is rotating, so the pump is spinning around this way. And what we see here is the tangential components to the velocity coming off it. Now this is a pump operating at the BEP. Okay. So the best efficiency point. And what you can see is, first of all, that the velocities are high. So in this case, 6.6 .6 meters per second, but look at the distribution of them. Okay, so you've got two jets uh, that are visible and the predominant flow direction is straight. Okay, so the full blade passage has been used, it's moving a good chunk of air if you or fluid if you integrate across any streamline here. You take a line along there and integrate the velocity profile across that, um, and getting 
the large area there is all high velocity, so I'm getting a, a high velocity, or sorry, a high flow rate through it. And if I look uh, over on this side, I see that the velocity components down here are much lower. So most of the energy is going into just momentum transfer to the fluid um, straight off. Okay, so that's on the, the best efficiency point. Now I'm starting to move off that. So if I, get, if I just draw the analogy with my um, centrifugal pump, we got delta P and Q. So I was around here, and now I'm shifting up to here. Okay, so I'm off the, uh, the, the best efficiency point. And now we can see what's happened is that the angle that the flow is coming off is more this way. And we can see in here that there's a much higher tangential component to the flow. We also notice that now much less of the area has been used. Okay, so if you compare the, the thickness of this jet coming off compared to the thickness of the jet here, okay, it's much lower. So we're getting the angle coming off and we have a lower flow rate coming through. We have higher tangential components. So this is now pumping less efficiently. It's all running at the same speed. Now, if we shift it even further, you can see that there's a little bit of fluid being squirted out the tips of the blades. And that we have a very strong uh, tangential component here to it. Or rate of component, sorry, rate of component. Okay, so this is all much higher, and we have now a much, much lower flow rate coming through. And what happens here is that there's now a load being transferred by the fluid into the bearings, whereas in the first case, when it's operating at the best efficiency point, we can see that the load is not really being transferred to the bearings inside here. Okay, and that makes a significant difference to the life of the pump. So the pump life and its reliability data is coming on the basis that it is operating at this point. But if you decide to operate it way off the, the, the efficiency point, uh, not only is it costing you lots of energy, but the lifespan of your pump is going to decrease substantially. Okay, and this shows you the effect of this is in a particular uh, fluid system. But the main point here is just to focus on the mechanics, the fluid mechanics of the pump as you move away from that best efficiency point. So what we want in our design is always to try and get in that sweet spot where we're at maximum efficiency, and therefore we maximize the life of our pump. Now I'll just uh, swap back. So what I want to do is to always make sure that we're tailoring our design, that it is operating in this region here. That that is our operating point is somewhere inside there. And that if we do happen to go outside it using a control valve for some of that, that it is done not very regularly, that our normal operating condition is in this region of maximum efficiency. So how do we decide that? There's a number of things we can do. One is we adjust our system curve. So we start to play with this curve here. And we can do things like increase the pipe diameter. So that will cause us to produce a low pressure system. Okay, we may change the fittings, things like that. Or if we're down here, we want to get up there, we may reduce the diameter, we may reduce, uh, increase the length of it, or do something to increase the pressure drop. Okay, so there's things we may play around with to adjust the system curve. The other option is, well, pick a different pump. Now, as long as you have, you have that luxury. In other times, you're kind of you want to do a bulk order of pumps, so you want to try and use one family of pumps um, because you'd be getting a particular discount on those. There may be a preferred standard pump to be used. So one thing you can also do is you can adjust the pump curve, and you can do that in a number of ways. Um, I'll see if I can list them here, if they don't allow me to write text. So one is to change the speed. We can also uh, put a pump in series.
purpose account in parallel. Okay, so there are the three things that uh, we can do. So if we change the speed, uh, what happens to the pump curve? So again, I'll just sketch out using our axis. So we've done P and with Q. So pressure drop and flow rate. And this will be our supplier data. Okay, for the pump. Now this will be at speed one. And you can purchase um, very often variable speed pumps. So if I change the speed to a different speed, what I get is in two. So the relationship then is how do I produce the second curve? So I'll be given this curve from the supplier. So it's simply Q1 over Q2. Okay, so I scale it that way. All right, so I can adjust a pump. So as the speed increases, I'm able to produce a family of curves at different speeds. Okay, so they're all scaled uh, in that manner. So that seems very attractive in that you know, just adjust the speed of the pump. And if I just sketch in my system curve, I'll do that in red. Okay, so this will be my system curve. You can see that I can cycle through a number of different operating points um, on that system curve. So I may well be able to hit the best efficiency point uh, like that. Okay, so that could be uh, one option to do. But adjusting the speed comes with a cost because I need to look at the power. Okay, so the power, I have to write in because the text thing isn't great. Power one over power two. So the power is a Q delta P. Uh, so then that gives me, because this thing is inertial, uh, the delta P equals with Q squared for the pump. Therefore, I have um, N1 over N2 cubed. Okay, that's a good sign there. All right, so my power goes up with the cube of the speed. So although I can adjust it very, very easily, uh, my energy requirements go up with that. So that will, that's something that I need to factor into my design. Uh, is that something I can live with? That's the cost of it. So again, if you're doing these kind of calculations, you can figure out, okay, well, I want to adjust the speed by, increase it by 50%. Uh, was the impact then on my power requirements? All right, so that is a, an additional consideration that needs to be borne in mind. Another thing I can do is I could put them in series or parallel. Again, if I draw my curve, and this is my delta p up here, my q. So I'll do um, I'll go through first of all. So we've got kind of a number of options to look at. Uh, and I could come to the same point there. And move back. All right, so this looks a bit busy. Um, so let's talk through it first. So the red is the standard pump. So I'll just write that in the text, text box if I can. So 
then we have a number of options. The blue. Oh, change this thing. I'll do a new one. Back to red. Okay, forget about that. And let's go back to the good old handwriting. So this one here is our standard pump. It's that blue when I changed it to red. Okay. Right, so single pump. And when we go to the blue curve, you can see that the pressure drop stays the same, but the flow rate has doubled. Okay. So this would be, we'll call that Q M, and this is 2 Q M. Okay. So I've doubled the flow rate, but I haven't done anything for the pressure drop. So what that is, is a pump in parallel. Because when the pumps are mounted side by side, we are doubling up on the flow rate, but we're not doing anything to the pressure drop. Okay. And that works very well for systems. So if I just draw the system curve um, here, that works very well in this kind of situation. So I go for an operating point here to an operating point here. Okay, so I get a nice change there in my flow rate. All right. Now, what if I had a high pressure system? So now my system is like this. So I'll call that system two. So now my operating point has gone from this point here to that point point there. So there's an incremental change in the flow rate given by doubling up the pumps. So in this case, it will make very little sense to put the two pumps in parallel because you get very, very little benefit. Whereas for this system in orange here, for this one, uh, you see a substantial change. Now, what if you've got greedy inside? Well, choose, I'm going to do it again. And um, this is great. I'm doubling up. So again, we fire it out, and this is two Q or sorry, three Q out here, QM. And now our operating point is here. And you can see that we're getting diminishing returns on our change of flow rate. Okay, so you start to get an initial gain on low pressure systems, but uh, it doesn't work as well you get diminishing returns as you drive on with it. Okay, so this is for pumps in parallel. Now the other option is if I put them up this way, this this pink curve here that I've drawn, I've doubled the pressure. And in this case what I have is pumps in series. So first of all I use one pump and that gives me a pressure rise and then I use a second pump that again gives me a pressure rise. So I double up the pressure rise but the same flow rate is going through them pretty much. Okay. So that is consistent. So now if you look at my high pressure system, what's happened? I've gone from an operating point here to an operating point out there. Okay, so now I've gotten a change um, in my system. All right, so for high pressure systems, I need to give it a pressure boost. So I see that return by putting the pumps in series. And again, you see that if I keep on doing this, I get the diminishing returns again. That's the yeah, space there is tight and keep my hand straight as I drop the line down. But you can see that the diminishing return. So, you know, increasing it by two to two uh, pumps in series or two pumps in parallel gives you a nice bang for your buck. But then you start to see diminishing returns on that. Okay, now this side looks very, very busy. Hopefully uh, you can follow that. I'll just see if I can just do it again here. So if we do it, sorry, there's a text. So 
Thompson series. So let's add the pressure. In parallel. So that's our, our, our take home message. Okay, so what we covered is the pump curve that's coming from the manufacturer, uh, how we can adjust that for speed, and how we can also adjust that for pumps in series and pumps in parallel. The key thing is always that you're basing your decisions of how that pump curve interacts with the system curve. So your design decisions are always inextricably linked to that curve. So you're looking at the intersection of those two curves and where that operating point is in relation to your system. And what is required is that flow is sufficient uh, for your needs in your system, um, or is it good for your pump? And what you can do to adjust your system and adjust your pump to get it on that sweet spot where you're meeting your system needs and also working the pumps efficiently. Okay, so we can adjust the speed, we can put them in series and pumps in parallel. And on the system side, we can change the diameter, we can change the length, we can add or remove fittings, things like that. The last thing I want to cover <clears throat> very briefly is the different types of uh, pump characteristic curves. So every time I've drawn a curve so far, I've drawn it as So I've done a P, U. So I've drawn like this. And this will be typical for a centrifugal. Uh, let me just see if I can write my text. So that's the workhorse. That's your most common uh, general pump that is out there. The other types that you'll have would be an axial pump which is what we saw on the slides where I showing you the best efficiency point and the effect of that on the pump itself. So for an axial pump, uh, they have a different characteristic. Whoops, and then a new slide, so I'll have to undo that one. And if I just sketch in a new curve. So an axial has a curve that looks a bit like this. Okay, and the best efficiency region is down around here. So again, this will be Dr. P. This is Q. And this is our best efficiency point down here. Okay, so in around there. Now with this, you've got to be careful. And these pumps are suited. So this is axial, just write that up there. So a bit like the pump that we saw in the where we had the flow field coming off it. Well, you can see in this pump here that the, this is very, very flat. And what that means is that for very minor pressure incursions, you see very large fluctuations in flow rate. So this is not a good thing. This is something you want to avoid. So you stay away from that region. And in fact, it's very hard to produce the data in that region because the pump uh, will produce a number of different flow rates very, very easily, depending on any disturbance tendencies. In this region up here, it's very linear, which is nice, but it's not very efficient in this region. So really, uh, in terms of efficiency, you're targeting this region here. So axial pumps are best suited for low pressure, high flow situations. Your centrifugal pump is a general pump. It's an all-rounder. The other one that we have um, is the positive displacement. So an example of this would be a gear pump where we have gear teeth that um, are intertwined. So again, let's put that to P. Here on this, I just draw a system curve. And these have a very interesting characteristic in that it's vertical. Okay, so this is for positive displacement. I'm going to try that text thing again. Let's 
so syringe or plunger pumps. Uh, gear pumps would be another uh, type of pump. Okay, that is that you'll see for this. And what they have is they have this vertical uh, cartridge curve. And what that means is that no matter what system it sees, if I draw in um, another system here, uh, my operating point hasn't changed. So I'm still getting the same flow rate, even though I've increased the resistance. So if I have a system that has, for example, uh, I'm using a syringe pump, a positive, some form of positive, positive displacement pump, and I have a control valve on it, um, it's no good because as I close the valve, I drive out my system pressure drop, but this pump just rams through. So it, it doesn't matter what resistance it sees, it just delivers the flow rate. So the setting on the pump determines what is delivered through it. And what is going on up here, uh, in this region up here, uh, where it curves a bit, that's where the pump is failing. So the seals in the pump are going. Okay, so seal failure. And uh, again, that's not something uh, you want to be operating. All right. So these kind of pumps, they have a vertical curve, which is nice. So it's pretty much insensitive. They'll run through whatever. Uh, they're very suited for uh, high pressure uh, systems okay, where you've got a lot of resistance. They just ram the, the stuff through. They have restrictions in that they see a lot of back pressure. Um, they can also um, have finite travel. So gear pumps work in, in a cycle, but syringe pumps have a finite travel. So very often you need to stage them so that by the time uh, well, a syringe pump does literally like a, a syringe like so, the plunger, this may be a ram of some sort, and that is driven and the fluid is compressed, it's squeezed out. So they've got this finite travel. And um, so you need to have a complex system of valves in place that you can, when this reaches the travel down here, the valve shuts and then another pump is able to kick in and deliver the flow. So we need these staggered and valved and then you need to refill this to reprime it. Okay, so their, their operation can be more complex. Uh, you would find them in places like waste treatment plants, things like that, for pumping sludges, things like that. Okay, so very, very viscous fluids that produce very, very high pressure drops. Right, so I've covered quite a lot of material in this. Um, obviously, the delivery on the blue button isn't the best. I'm restricted in terms of the slides and that. Uh, hopefully, uh, this has made sense to you. The key point is that you always work off the pressure flow curve. Okay, that's what you always want to produce for your system and match your pump to the system. So you always have to size your pump and match it to the system and understand how your pump behaves in the context of your system. And you base all your design decisions on this curve. So your objective is really to produce these two curves uh, the system curve, right to one of the earlier slides. So this system curve uh, here, so you produce the proper one from your calculations, and you get the pump curve from the supplier, and you look at the operating point. And based on that, you look at where you want to be. So for example, you may want to be up here. You decide, well, am I going to adjust the speed of my pump? Send me there. Uh, I'm going to adjust my system, reduce the pressure a bit. So I want to get this pump over into this region. And um, so I would adjust the system to get me into this location there. And is that my required flow rate that I want to deliver? Okay, so these are the kind of design decisions that uh, you want to be able to make. But they are based on this pump uh, system curve interaction. And that is to be the basis for all your design decisions. Okay, and that's the, the real key take home. In terms of pumps, the centrifugal is your default one, that's the general workhorse. Um, particular pumps will have different curves. So we've seen the typical ones would be the axial, the positive displacement, and the centrifugal. Okay, and again, you should know those three pumps 
pump curves off that when you see when you say oh yeah that that's that's the curve of a, an axial pump or that's the curve of a positive displacement okay but the centrifugal one has this kind of um parabolic shape okay because it's an, an inertial machine uh we also looked at uh, how we can adjust your pump using speed for example pumps in series pumps in parallel so you can play around with the pumps and you can also play around your system and then get a bang onto that sweet spot where you want it to be uh, and you're free to choose what's best for you but just look at the impacts of your design decisions and try and quantify them that really is the, the, the key take home okay uh thank you for listening i'm going to do a session later on that um it'll just be an open session that you can join and uh, i'll field any questions if you're if you're connection and my own internet connection is uh is suitable for it i'll send it out on sulis anyway okay take care talk to you again bye bye